Howdy folks, Michael with the CCERP Podcast. Hope you're doing alright, we're back again. I just spent a little bit of time outdoors, it was nice. What, 29th of October 2021. Nice weather out this morning. When I went out it was a nice brisk 55. Get out there, barefoot, shirtless, just in shorts. Other people are out there all bundled up. Not really appreciating the sun, absorbing it appreciating the fresh air, the life you feel, with that briskness, the tightening of your skin, the coldness that we're not used to in Houston, Texas. Of course, other people up there, up north, would be like, man, 55, that's warm, (laughs) heat wave, but different context here, where we're going from um, latitude about Alexandria, um, Suez Canal, that's about where we're, we, we are on the earth. Um, a lot warmer, so the cold affects you a little differently when you get used to the hot. But still nice, beautiful day, a little windy, blue sky, windier yesterday. It was nice getting out, moving, enjoying my local Cypress Creek, out in the woods. Um, got a little bit of foraging done. Got some stuff to make a kind of green tea, plant infusion kind of thing. Some southern dewberry leaves and loblolly pine and some wood sorrel and some yupon holly. So that'll be some good stuff. Make a nice hot tea. Um, Picked up a little trash. So I didn't get to do some of the intense stuff I wanted. Had to make it back here to do this podcast. But got some nice mobility, good short run, time in nature. Um, moved around a little bit in a complex environment. Break out of the house where it's all flat and monotonous and um, same thing like in the gym. Gyms are great. Recommend them. Support local business. But hey, we need to get outdoors where it's real. Complex environment helps make, make a more complex mind. So if you're getting outdoors too, especially in this COVID thing, all this stuff going on where we need to get out, be healthy, boost the immune system, um, not just hide and um, hope some injection will help us 100%. Um, You know, some injections and vaccines and medicines are good, of course, certain times, certain contexts, but the true is the whole. We're a whole human animal. we got to think about that. Um, The immune system, our whole overall health, has to be there for other stuff to matter in the first place but get out fresh air vitamin d the beauty the serenity helps us physically emotionally socially um psychologically many different ways so get out there do that please excuse me and push your envelope a little bit um you know, if you're out, bring a jacket. If this is cool for you, but hey, take the jacket off a little bit, put it back on, take it off, expose your skin to the cold, um, put the jacket back on. You know, the jacket will be there, so you can take it off and put it back on as you please, but at least get some exposure. Push your envelope. Get yourself used to adapting different conditions. Um, it'll help. So, today we're going to talk a little bit about the mental aspect of being outdoors. Um, We've talked about different topics, talked about the physical aspect, fitness, movement, human, total human activity, movement in the outdoors, um, how to do it well. But then there's also, of course, being human animals, we got the conscious aspect, the mind aspect, contemplation, mindfulness, meditation, um, enjoying nature, being observant. There's that whole realm that we can discuss, analyze, synthesize, think about, put into practice, um, a lot going on there. And to help us talk about that, introduce some ideas. We have um, 
master mover extraordinaire, moving at nap, moving at master instructor Danny Clark back on. Hi, Danny. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the warm introduction. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Danny's got a big background in movement and being outdoors and um, building his own house in the outdoors and all this stuff. So, um, he knows his stuff. I just heard the bird in the background there. So, you're outdoors, Danny? Yes, I am sitting outside nice. and just looking at a beautiful view. I'm in New Mexico. Actually, there's a bunch of balloons, people in hot air balloons floating kind of right above the mountains. Huh, huh. And I'm a little jealous of their perspective right now. Um, but yeah, just happy to be out here and breathing some fresh air, talking to you. Sweet. Yeah, it'd be nice if maybe... I could do some of that to record outside with the phones being more powerful, basically like little mini computers. Um, could probably start to do that. I just need a good internet connection. It'd be nice to be outside also recording some of this, although the video would be smaller and all that, but there is an app for this thing. Well, it certainly lends itself to uh, beautiful flowing thoughts. I find for sure. Definitely mm -hmm. super helpful for that. Yeah. Or even if I'm indoors, I like to have the windows open, um, get some light in. Um, but, so, um, so let's dig in. So, I was, wanted Danny to be on, asked Danny for some topic suggestions, and he suggested this whole mental aspect of being outdoors and contemplation. So, um. What made you think of this as a thing to discuss, Danny? Well, I'd say that as a whole, it's kind of what my personal focus is at this point. You know, I've spent so many years um, working on physical competence, first through sport and then through the kind of the fitness industry and then through MoveNet. I feel like I have a really good grip on that aspect. Um, you can always be a better mover. But for me, honestly, it's not really the point anymore. Um, I'm not trying to be, you know, a, a stunt person, do crazy things, put myself at a, at a lot of risk, start to think about the health of my body, my joints too much, as we know, can break down the system. It's kind of finding that sweet spot. And um, so, you know, I feel like I found a really nice rhythm with movement. I like to train a lot more instinctually or intuitively, we could say. And so over the years, there's been sort of, sort of another theme that's kind of always run through the current of my thought, my interest, and it's what led me to study biology in school um, and just be connected to nature in the first place. And that's just really um, just a curiosity, a hunger, a thirst, you could say, to just understand reality, understand the world, um, just understand some of the more existential questions, um, because, you know, being a young man, I, uh, you know, I, I wrestled in the winter and it was cold and dark and that was a whole awesome thing. But in the summer, I would spend time, a lot of time outside. I was fortunate to have a father who, you know, took me fishing a lot and just exposed me to being outside. And I just kind of caught this, um, I don't know how to say it. I mean, I just caught this kind of love for the for being outside that was I couldn't really describe in words but was more of like a feeling it gave me peace it gave me restoration it gave me a time to really put things in perspective and recharge myself to kind of step back into school and wrestling and 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 be do the best I could there but in my mind I always even during that time when I was doing these more you know sport oriented and school oriented pursuits I would always just have nature in my heart you know I'd close my eyes and see the sun sparkling off a river and it just gave me peace in my body and I just as a whole always wanted to understand what that peace was about what that feeling was about being connected to something greater than myself and just wanted to explore it um, wanted to understand it 
and hence studied more, you know, got into the sciences, because I think the sciences are one of the primary pursuits of saying like, okay, what is reality? Let's examine it. What is, you know, what's inside of us, what's around us. And um, so as a whole, I've been pursuing that path, but sort of diverged away from the kind of science model of, you know, reductionist kind of um, textbook based thinking. And um, not that I reject that, but just wanted to kind of examine those bigger picture questions that I don't really feel like is um, studied very much. That being like, who am I? What is consciousness? What is mind? What is nature? What is the essence of nature? Um, you know, well, like what is happening essentially? You know, we get a lot, we kind of get told what is happening and it works to a degree, but it also doesn't to a degree, right? A lot of us end up um, not feeling so good and we see um, conflict in the world um, that some of it seems unnecessary or there might be better ways. So anyway, I think the, you know, to me, spending time in nature and examining some of the most fundamental questions, um, I'm not necessarily hoping that I find all the answers as much as I just discover a lot in the process and it's enjoyable and peaceful to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's one thing about, uh, our, some aspects of our modern culture and education system, um, that view of science as reductionistic, um, there is some of that, but that's more of a platonic, I think, um, viewpoint. Um, maybe some other people too. I don't know, you know, what all influences go into that. It'd be a whole like multi-volume thing in itself, the history and philosophy of that. But um, proper science would be more Aristotelian looking at what Aristotle did and as Galileo and others did develop out of that. Um, as Galileo himself said, well, actually, let's see, Etle Ness, um, in a book about Galileo, that's where this was. Um, he said that Galileo engaged in a radical renewal of science in other words, he rejected the Platonic and Ptolemaic idea of what science is and how it should be done. So he revolutionized science in content and in method by making it Aristotelian and bringing in observation and the evidence of the senses, whereas the other people were kind of dismissing it, it'd be secondary just some idea came first and you can see how that comes up in education a lot. Unfortunately, it's just this idea and you don't need experience. You don't got to develop it. Just, Oh, have memorize the table of elements or memorize Newton's laws as if they came out of nowhere and Hey, you're all good. Do all these like math problems. Um, but that's a invalid view of what science really is should be. You know, you look at the people who really practitioned it, the, the great practitioners of science who really knew how to do it. Um, Darwin, Galileo, Newton, um, or one person nowadays I like, Baron Heinrich, um, among others. You know, there's just, I've read some of his stuff, hit him on my podcast, he just comes to mind. But they were immersed in experience. It's a whole integrated approach instead of um, just looking at words, looking at things in isolation. Um, it's about synthesis and connection. It's analyzing and synthesizing. And that's the real Greek um, program for how to reason and how to do science, which was kind of lost some of that synthesis aspect, but it's, Integrating, integrating, integrating. That's what some people have to do. Um, Darwin's work. You know, you got chemistry, math, history, geology, biology, all this stuff brought together. Um, 
Newton bringing together terrestrial mechanics and celestial mechanics and astronomy and mathematics and physics. Um, it's about connecting and being real, and being involved and immersed in experience and identifying conceptually what we know and experience. Um, doing that in biology would make us way more in contact with what's going on instead of going to this DNA stuff right away and boring people out of their minds and all that. Yeah, they should be out experiencing, enjoying, contemplating, observing, getting biology firsthand. Um, I think that's one thing that would help a lot in that respect. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, being, uh, you know, I, I, professors try to bring you out into the field to show you how they do things, which is great. Mm -hmm. The methods of study and it's, it's all great. But I, I mean, I personally found that by studying it in that way for me, particularly just for me, that it just kind of like it, it, it lost the um, appeal because ultimately, again, you know, we're taught we have to study the parts. So we're dissecting, we're analyzing, mm -hmm. we're identifying. And I think that's 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 a piece of the puzzle. That's a huge piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. But for yeah. me, the feel of it is what really captivates me, not just the identification of it. And so, OK, so how do you study the feel of something? Well, I mean, you know, th there's a lot of studies that show now you go out into nature and they, they synthesize um, and do studies to show that, you know, your prefrontal cortex changes, how it, <laughs> all, all this type of stuff, you start to relax. They start to show the neurological patterns of, of, of let's say, just relaxation. And that's, that's cool. I like that too. But I just think there's a lot more to understand in nature. And um, I think there's... It, different ways to approach it, which are still very in line with science, as you're saying, based on observation, based on meditation, based on contemplation. And I think that it can paint a more, a, a picture of nature that is a little bit more holistic and maybe even more intuitive for some folks. Um, so that if you're not interested in going out in science and just labeling um, and studying parts, you can kind of understand the whole a little differently. And what I mean by that is, and this is, this is kind of like an East meets West sort of thing, you know, just for example, you go into meditation and let's say you're not even looking at nature, you're just looking inward and you do this type of stuff long enough and you see a lot what these mystics of the East talk about. You see these mandalas and stuff, these shapes and these forms that are a function of mind, right? of some kind, right? I mean, they're not, you know, you could say, okay, it's just your mind. Well, okay, well, I'm still observing something. And these shapes and forms seem to be at least somehow part of the essence of how form comes into existence. And those forms exist in nature too. This is geometry, right? This is all the, the things that come into shape. And, uh, you know, so uh, that's just one simple example. So, it's, it, you know, I think in a lot of ways we can bridge art and science through our just a more holistic, I would say open-minded approach to observing nature and ourselves, kind of linking those two. That's kind of what I personally have found at this point, but it doesn't have to even be that complex or deep. Quite simply, you can learn, I feel like you can learn a lot about yourself just by being out in nature and just by, as you say, feeling the sun on your skin, feeling the cold, feeling how it affects you, just kind of seeing yourself, your own lab in a way to help you understand how you function, how you find homeostasis, which is just sort of that even good feeling, um, how you can align yourself with the patterns and rhythms of nature, maybe a little bit more calm, flowing like a river, all these type of things. So I just think there's a lot to be, you know, understood I think what would still be considered scientifically without it always being that exact method that classical science follows. What do you think? Yeah, there's um, the whole entirety of human experience um, that needs to be brought into play. There's, as you said, the aesthetics 
um, all these different aspects and like you can't do science without observation. You got to experience, you got to feel. Um, that's the whole basis of it. Montessori gets that. Some other people get that. Um, kind of on a related thought, I like the way Baron Heinrich says something like that. Um, I don't remember his exact quote, but um, something like, those who reject anecdotes also reject truth. Yep. That's great because it's like, um, and I think if you look at what science really is, it's just a systematic bunch of anecdotes. It's not some like magically different thing. What does someone say when they allegedly do science? They're giving an anecdote. You know, one day I was like in the lab and I got this chemical with a symbol and I use this thing and I got this little dish and I put this in and this is how it reacted. It's an anecdote. It's systematic and they do a bunch of them, but hey, it's like a story of what happened in a particular thing. Sorry, people. Science is about real individual things. Um, yep. And so that part is essential. And that's how we learn a lot of things. That's how, um, you know, people had some experience and they start learning about um, what's going on? Like, why am I feeling like this? And, you know, then you learn about electricity and the nervous system functions electrically and all this stuff. Um, it's a necessary starting point. And even if you don't develop things scientifically, we, we want to know about the, the world. It's like Aristotle said that a long time ago. Um, all humans desire to know. That's like first line of... Um, the metaphysics. Yep. All men by nature desire to know. An indication of this is the delight we take in our senses. For even apart from their usefulness, they are loved for themselves. And above all others, the sense of sight. And so yes. On, unquote. I love that. And that's, that's honestly a thought I've had very recently, which is, um, you know, a lot of us are seeking in some way. And a lot of people turn to, you know, drugs or habits that they find that are not so good for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like just yeah. tons of sugar or whatever. And they just want to will themselves away from this stuff. Like, oh, if I just control myself, this like philosophy of like, oh, if I just like get everything under control. But it's like, well, what if the answer to seeking is seeking itself, right? Maybe there's mm -hmm. a longing in you to seek and find and discover and explore. And so when we put everything externally in the hands of these genius scientists, these these people who are brilliant and, you know, make these profound scientific discoveries that are that help us understand the world, it still externalizes that knowledge is somewhere else. These other smart humans are the ones that tell us where knowledge is and it takes it out of our own hands. You can be scientific without being a scientist. Amen. And yeah. you do that by going and living your life and following your callings and following where, wherever your inner vision, your inner wisdom, whatever you want to call it takes you. And for me personally, it's out in nature. And I think for a lot of people, they feel that same call because you can discover the most fundamental aspects of reality, the fabric of reality, including yourself in nature. It's really hard to do to find anything new about yourself or maybe even some maybe even find a discovery about the world about an insight that no one else has before you don't really know um if you stay connected to a culture and we need culture it's not i'm not vilifying culture but a culture that kind of keeps us in our kind of instinctual primal fear-based thinking stuck in the past worrying about the future um, worried about everything, worried about what other people think, worried, worried, worried constantly. How are we ever going to get to higher level thought or understanding our own space of wisdom if we're immersed in that all the time? The noises of culture, it's loud, like how, mm -hmm. it's, it's sensory overload. If we can remove ourselves from that, this is just for me a very simple idea. Remove ourselves from that for a little while, get into nature, allow our mind to clear, allow worried thoughts to dissipate. And um, kind of figure out who we are, whether it's through thinking, through contemplation, whether it's through experiencing and just feeling the, the sensual aspect of nature, which you alluded to in that quote. Nature is very sensual in a lot of ways. It, it evokes your senses, your sight, your feel, um, texture, everything. And just figure out what's going on. 
Um, if nothing else, even if you don't have this profound insight about the nature of reality, you're going to discover something about yourself. That's for sure. You're going to think you're going to stop thinking in so many constructs of like what culture tells you how to think and maybe think in your own terms about who you are, what you feel, what's authentic inside of you, what drives you. And I find personally that that happens very naturally. It's not like you have to think really hard. It just kind of emerges when you're out there. The things that are important come forth. The feelings that are important come forth. And you're able to synthesize using this beautiful higher level th- neocortex we have to synthesize incredible thought and um, weave yourself in a lot of ways and uh, uh, the opportunity to, to, to live a better life full of actions that are meaningful and in ways that are benevolent to yourself. And I think when you're benevolent to yourself, you're benevolent to the whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the... Uh, you know, I feel like there's a big emphasis now on meditation, which is great, which is sort of like the idea that you're just going to clear your mind and find stillness, which is a great starting point. But there's not a lot of talk about contemplation itself, you know, and contemplation, you know, everyone, what image do you get when you think of contemplation? Um, let me see. There's things running through my mind. I gotta like stop grab one of them and try to like pinpoint it and say it, but like it's just maybe someone oh. sitting with looking at a book, yes, thinking about something, someone being outdoors and just looking at what's there, the whole blue sky and light and trees and green and birds and wind and just taking it all in the, you know, those yes. are some things that come up. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think of that classical Greek statue, right. Of the guy kind of resting his head on his um, fist or whatever it is, his palm and just uh, his eyes are, I think, open, like you said, taking in the whole, but also definitely deep in thought. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and there's something to that. Actually, that's something I'd love to explore with you as, you know, having a much more depth of philosophy than I do. Like, what is the origin of contemplation? What was the essence? What were people trying to actually do in that state? And all I can say is, you know, like, I would love to know that information, but it's something I feel like that's very intuitive for people. It's like the sit and think and observe type of posture that lends itself to insight. And those insights can be very profound or they can be very, they're always profound in some way, right? They could be something very small, like, wow, the sky is beautiful. Or it could be something very profound uh, about yourself. Or in the case of a lot of our most revered scientists in history, you know, like things that were prior, prior to this, oftentimes like unsolvable to them, some math problem or whatever, flashes of insight come through that help them solve it. You know, Einstein classically, from what I understand, would like sit in a bubble bath and just watch bubbles <laughs> burst in front of his face. And then in those moments, that's when he would get his, mo- his most profound insights about reality. So there's this, to me, what's really beautiful about this idea of contemplation <clears throat> is it's, it's, Meditation for a lot of people is very challenging, right? It's like you sit there and you're, you're, you think you're supposed to stop thinking and that's incredibly hard, right? But contemplation is so accessible, so simple, right? It's just like clear, go to somewhere beautiful where you feel inspired and sit there and think for a little while and maybe just like allow your thinking to become clearer by just observing first around you and taking in the beauty, feel inspired, feel good feelings. And then your thoughts become a lot clearer. It's something any person can do. And I think it's so incredibly profound. And you don't have to draw conclusions from it either. I think contemplation, unless I'm getting the concept kind of wrong, but contemplation, you can just go there and contemplate, observe, um, experience, um, I have to look it up in a dictionary, see actually if we got, if I'm getting off on the concept a little bit and going too far, but um, just basically, or even if it is drawing conclusions and just, hey, um, 
get the basis of contemplation and just experience. Just go out. I know. Yeah. You don't got to draw a particular conclusion, conclusion but that's good because we desire to know. We want to classify, find cause effect relationships, conceptualize. It's our nature. We have to. It helps. Um, but, you know, analyze, synthesize, but just enjoy experience be real um yes yeah I, I i totally agree i think that actually drawing conclusions oftentimes is counterproductive because how could you draw a conclusion on some of the most profound meaningful questions that are out there there are no conclusions in a lot of ways it's, it's what you know as jordan peterson says it's the problem of frame when you try to box something in you lose it you know like <laughs> the essence of reality is so beyond our comprehension to a degree. I, I, what I think, you know, we're still learning so much. How could you box it in into one conclusion? And I think that a lot of times through contemplation, it's actually like an ongoing practice that leads to conclusions sometimes over time, but leaving it very open-ended is I think just a part of the essence of intelligence. It's like you observe, you feel, maybe you get some insights, maybe you write them down. But you keep asking the question. You never stop asking the question. Who am I? What's my purpose? What is the nature of reality? What is happening? Why does this person act this way? And how can I peaceably resolve this conflict? All these type of things that are important to us are an ongoing dynamic, uh, you could say, stage of action in life, right? So participating actively in it instead of reacting to it in our kind of primal brain instinctual thinking where we're just protective, we want to just box ourselves in and just sort of like withdrawal or fight or whatever. This is kind of the antidote for that, I think. Being able to be in a space where your mind is clear, your heart is open, and you're able to synthesize, use that higher level neocortex thinking, um, integrated thinking to continue to integrate, right? Because life seems to be an ongoing process of integration, as you say. And so how do we keep integrating? And I, I, I just think that allowing people, giving people some basic practices and maybe even some scaffolding of like, just like they do in meditation, like here's how you can contemplate. Here's some things to think about. Here's some ways to do this. It makes it really accessible and enables I think overall what's most important, which is a much richer, deeper life. Yeah. Um, and in too many philosophies, I think they try to prescribe reality um, about the nature of things. I think some people who do philosophy get it right and say philosophy can't say what things are, but they can say that Philosophically, all you can say is things exist and they have identity. They are what they are. Um, other than that, it's the role of the scientist. A philosopher is a scientist. That's a kind of science, a form of science. Um, science is basically an inductive, integrated understanding of the nature of things and their cause-effect relationships. Um, Different sciences are, of course, physics, chemistry, but also psychology, mathematics, philosophy. Um, but it's up to the different sciences to say that, and again, not to prescribe things like, uh, is, are things ultimately material or energy? You know, we don't know yet. We're not omniscient. We're always, as you say, learning more, and we have to keep that solidly in mind as a context um sometimes we have learned everything about something in a certain context but we got to know that identify if we got the broad, a broad enough context to know when we've got the fundamental elements or what the nature of some things are but yeah it's just like the nature of the world is to for things to be what they are and to have identity but other than that it's special knowledge that you got to take a long time to figure out. And there's always more. There's all kinds of connections we can make um, to physics, to chemistry, to psychology, to all this stuff. Um, and then we're doing more real science or the basis of it instead of 
applying what someone else says, you get out and you're experiencing things and then you should do what real science is, like let your curiosity drive it. It's this passionate thing involved, not some like, unfortunately kind of like maybe people get this idea about science from what they're made to do and they're forced to do it. You follow this little pattern in a book and maybe you're kind of bored and things like that. And some people get a bad idea of science and what they really like is they don't like the way it was done, but they blame science for it. It's not science. You know, science is about passionately wanting to know the world conceptually, and it's driven by your curiosity. That's why these people who did great work are curious and they're digging into it. You know, they don't do stuff they hate and just come up with stuff in a book that other people have done because no one's done it. Um, I think real knowledge yeah. and real science is like independent. So you got to get out there and experience, contemplate, put all this, these words aside or stuff you might have learned or you think you know, um, get that independent thought. And then the independent thought, the curiosity, then you're starting to like get the basis for doing science. Um, right. Yeah, I would. I, I think that um, I totally agree with you. I think what happens oftentimes is there are people that are very curious and are like pure scientists in the sense that like their whole life's purpose is this pursuit of knowledge and understanding itself, mm -hmm. right? Maybe not knowledge of all things, but maybe it's knowledge of one thing. They're really interested in DNA and, uh, you know, gene transcription or whatever it is. And they have just this like, hunger and curiosity. It's like some people love violin. All they want to do is play the violin. Yeah. Right. And so science sometimes gets a bad rap, I think, because it becomes in a lot of ways – inaccessible for a lot of people it's it, it, like, like 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 the medical world in a lot of ways it becomes this like kind of occult esoteric pursuit that like yeah. only the few that know the language can actually understand and that's necessary for those people to be able to communicate with each other that need that language so there's that and i i think that that's 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 there for a reason that's what drives scientific understandings is this like way deep 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 dive into things but the other the other um, purpose of science, and I think honestly, the just as important, if not more important, is that it's scaffolding for others to to understand the world. Right? It's like by the work of these brilliant minds, we can take what's the information that's gathered, and we can live a richer, better life. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, oftentimes, is it, that is happening. Of course, we all live better lives because of the, the pace, the, the foundation of science that we rest upon, right? We have running water. We have security. We have, um, you know, we're able to use what we've learned from chemistry to, to create amazing things, right? To medically and just in our everyday domestic lives. But as a whole, I feel like the scaffolding of science um, is very focused on just kind of dealing with disease, right? Instead of actual, like, you could say one, one way of saying it would be enlightenment, right? Like learning how to live a, a life that feels light and that feels good to take all the, you could say the suffering of our ancestors that it took to get us here to this amazing place where there's abundance and do beautiful things with it, right? To, to, to live happy, not locked in fear mm -hmm. to, do things like permaculture where we work with nature and create beautiful food systems that feed nature itself and feed ourselves. Right. But we're sort of locked in this sort of, um, fear based thinking, the scarcity based thinking, this, um, this kind of like dog eat dog world model. And a lot of times it comes back to, unfortunately, some of the conclusions people draw from the scaffolding of science that has been provided. We're in this like Darwinian kind of like only the strongest survive type of mindset. And it's a, a mindset of scarcity when the reality is at this point, actually now that might've been, that might've been true in the past, but like now we have so much at our fingertips that we are creators, right? We are creators of this. We can, we can reimagine this world and create it. I believe that anyway. And people that I see demonstrated all the time, you know, like we talked about last time with my mentor, Ben Falk, creating food systems in Vermont. 
And there's just so much more now, I feel like, where we're ready to kind of understand as a whole, like science, again, bridging into art, where we can create reality, we can see it, we can understand it better. And through studying our consciousness, studying what's possible, um, we can just create better syntheses. And so that's that's kind of where I'm at as a whole is like we have to, um, you know, make sure that modern science is there as, just like education as a scaffold to help us live a better life and also not disable us, not they like, oh, the, externalize it to where the experts know all and you should just follow what they say. It's like, no, this is what the experts say. And you it's should. Just a, yeah, it's just a roadmap, um, just a it's recommendation. A Think for yourself. It, it's like, actually, if you believe that, good, but make sure you actually discover it yourself. Because yeah. a lot of the most fundamental things can be discovered, just uh, they, they need to be discovered through your own experimentation, your own contemplation, your own experience of life. And that makes it a lot more um, usable at the end of the day. And I, I, I just hope that the more we progress that we can spend a little more time thinking about big picture things, not in a fear-based way, but in a really positive, optimistic way of like what, what's possible. Yeah. And then with the medicine, your modern medicine, you're talking about there is where some of the, um, compromised view of science comes into play where people are reductionistic, um, looking at one chemical in isolation for other things. Um, where, where we need to return to the real Greek program of analyzing and synthesizing, being holistic. Um, health is not, does not come from one little chemical. It comes from a whole human lifestyle. As you say, we need to pursue happiness properly understood, but that requires knowing our nature, knowing what species appropriate things are for our biological survival and thriving food I, culture i think one of those societies as we what i think one of those things to happiness that as we alluded to earlier is just to seek right instead yeah. of just kind of like stay comfortable stay safe it's like get out there seek ask questions you know like if you don't do that how could you be happy i don't really fully understand that you know like yeah you have questions in your mind, you have the answers to them. And you can use the intelligence and the efforts of modern day and, and all, the, all the scholars, all the people that are provided great scaffolds to help you. That to me is just so foundational to, um, and it's something that's not taught to us very well, I feel like in education, right? As we grow up. Being stuck indoors not able to get away from things that bother you. Um, yeah, being outdoors, it's one thing too, like it helps you move mentally and physically away from a stress. And that right there is important. Um, that's what a lot of animals do. And I think that's a perspective I hadn't taken on this before, but one reason some people say they think that we have some emotional problems nowadays is that people don't move. Whereas what is an animal, every animal, and we're animals, what do animals do when they're scared um, or they're angry or stressed, they move, they run. If we can't run, it's like being trapped in a cage. I, I hypothesize. And so it's going to lead to stresses, which are embodied in epigenetics. We can't escape from them. That's going to cause some problems. Um, I'll put some, a link to like a book and some stuff about that. Um, some people have found that if someone's young two or three their parents are really engaged in a big fight maybe that happens a bunch that leads to epigenetic changes that can increase their risk of cancer and heart attack and all this stuff like later in life um you know we're not um separate from the world and we're not not affected by this stuff we are um so if we can move mentally and physically from that bad situation to something that shows volition choice that we can do something and it shows we're choosing another primal aspect like like there's a primal aspect of fear and all that but 
Another important thing is happiness, joy, um, which is going to be stuff that should happen more often and would have, you know, the fear and stuff wouldn't have happened as much. And, you know, people should live more for joy and happiness than avoiding pain. But uh, get out, enjoy nature, and we're making the choice to put joy above the fear and the hate and we're showing we can do it we're showing we can be successful it's going to lead to more confidence um i think there's some stuff like that involved too get yeah, out I... and then even if you got stuff to think about maybe think about it a little bit but don't ruminate but say um okay this bad stuff's going on but damn it i'm gonna be out here and be happy i'm gonna enjoy the sunshine or enjoy this rain or make the most of it this is awesome. Being out here in nature is so beautiful. Look at this blue sky, blue sky and blue trees. To hell with these bad thoughts. I'm focusing on that, damn it. Yeah. Well, it makes me think of when you say like, okay, like parents that traumatize their kids in a way, set them up for the epigenetic expression of genes that, you know, cause cancer later on. To me, I think of the immediate behavior it causes, right? It's like, go to your room, which means basically go in your room and don't move. Right. Like yeah, you got to sit yeah. in your bed and do nothing. You can't run. You you're taught literally to just stop moving and to just feel bad. Well, what does that do later in life? It teaches you that pattern that when you feel suppressed by culture or any external forces to just kind of sit and not do anything. Well, what does that do to your biology? Right. Like, as you mentioned earlier, we're electrical beings, you know, like this electricity inside of us doesn't doesn't just sustain itself on its own right we need good quality food so instead of eating junk food to feel better we need food that actually makes us want to move right we, we need mm -hmm. to eat good food and we need to use our body exercise all those bio electrical chemical pathways that lead to movement right so what happens is we're taught mentally to have this reflex to like stop moving and maybe just eat junk food to feel better and then electrically, our whole system starts to shut down over time, right? And how, you know, to me, like uh, that pattern reinforces itself in what we call the deconditioning cycle of move that mm -hmm. and leads to, yeah, of course, that's going to lead to cancer because your body's not literally, it's, it stops functioning properly. All the biochemical pathways involved in regulating your entire system, including removing dead crap cells, stops working. Yeah, that's a good right? point, so, too. Like, yeah. So it's kind of like, I almost think it's disempowering in a way to just, to, I mean, I love even the idea and the science of epigenetics. It's beautiful, but it's still very esoteric for most people. It's like, Oh, if I had a trauma, now I'm trapped with this thing and now I'm going to get cancer. It's like, no, it's the behavior, right? It's the, it's like, let's, let's make this concrete. You stop moving. You started eating poorly. That's why you're going to have cancer later in life. Right? Yeah. Like you can reverse this at any time. And then again, epigenetics, your interaction with your environment and yourself is going to kick in and reverse everything. It's going to yeah. enable you to thrive, you know? So that's, that's, I feel like where some people, even with the more modern science language, while well-intentioned and really accurate, it still can like externalize and put them kind of at the will of these, like these, these genes that are like lingering that are going to kill them someday. You know, that's, that's, that's my only point there. Um, yes. And so these things to consider, right? Yeah, that's why they need the broader context of philosophy and not being carried away with this one thought. Um, some stuff's yeah. happening, but what else? Just like uh, Stephen Jay Gould, he wrote an excellent article um, called The Median is Not the Message. Awesome. I love the hell out of that. But he was diagnosed with some type of cancer. The doctor says, okay, well, um, start taking care of things. Um, you're not going to be living very long, but being a scientist, he was a great evolutionary biologist, knowing statistics, he looked into it because maybe the median life expectancy was a few months or whatever. Um, but he knew that the median was an abstraction. It is not a real concrete thing. So, and he knew with statistics there was a distribution. So he dug into things and said, okay, well, what puts people at the tail end of the distribution? Um, you got people who 
live less than the median of let's say three months some people who live more you know an average is an average because it's a it's like a generalization mathematical generalization from a bunch of individual things so what puts people away up at the end of things where it's like a year and year like decade long life expectancy he dug into that and sure enough um did some things change things change things um there'd be epigenetic changes involved and ended up living longer um he ended up dying from something else like many many years later so yeah yeah we have choice um and while Maybe there are some things that we can't change with our epigenetics. There is plenty we can, and we should. And we should focus on the primal drive for joy. And part of that is to say it's going to come out from, it's going to come about from being outdoors and contemplating. And you don't even have to like think a lot. Um, when I'm out, you know, it's just you stay in focus. You're ready to conceptualize or think but um it's just the experience i don't care yeah like, if we do some move net things and i'm like crawling through the woods i'm paying attention and going really slow and it's just this sometimes like when i'm out i notice something different kicks in it's this whole different mindset or way of being um this total awareness that focuses on detail on the whole at the same time, like just kicks in and you, you gotta like, I don't, I don't know if you can really train someone in that. They gotta like, it's an independent thing. It's coming about from inside. You gotta go out and do it. You gotta go out and be outside and be contemplate, pay attention, experience, let things happen, move the in the environment be mindful and observant and this habit will come in. Maybe you won't, you won't notice it right away, but then one day it'll be like, whoa, snap. It's like, I feel totally different. Something will start to kick in maybe when you go outdoors, but there doesn't have to be a lot of thought involved. It's just on an experiential level. And I think from what I've read, one thing that that happens when people are young, and I think it's because of, improper philosophy and bad epistemology, bad view of concepts, we don't develop in a consistent whole way from that. There's this like break between there and how we think conceptually later. But with kids, they see the whole. Everything is there at once. Maybe this came up in the Greek experience by Baura, um, great book, or maybe uh, about the Greeks by Edith Hamilton. Maybe that's where I saw it. But the Greeks were kind of like that. They would see things entirely as a whole. And that's why they put, they had their architecture as it was. Um, they'd have, whereas now, oh, we just like build this monument out of nowhere and the building's good, but what the hell does it have to do with everything around it and the environment? They didn't do that. It's like you build um some temple consistent with the way its environment should be kind of like frank lloyd wright did getting ideas from the japanese but um that's and so you know the kids they got this total aspect and then maybe with some education it's like broken up and people don't stay connected to the senses anymore they don't use concepts right um because of training and it's a hard thing to figure out in history. I sure the hell didn't figure it out on my own, but then they got this like broken perspective. But if you get back out, you're starting to get back into that and experience the world and be conscious and mindful as we used to be and should be, even when we're still thinking conceptually. Concept should be more unified with the whole experience instead of being separate. But yeah, just get out there and let things happen, put some thoughts aside, but be ready to think. It's not being irrational. It's connecting with the world, you know, just let everything come in. The feelings, yeah. all the different senses, the touches, the um, 
sight, the sounds, just be open to it all. Yep. Well, as you say, the, the state of the child is to be open and receptive, right? Yeah. Like our senses are engaged. They just are. We're born that way. We have to, it's even in our animal nature, to be open and receptive. But we're, this, we're in this vessel that's so powerful, even more powerful, especially from a thinking perspective, than our, you know, and our animal um, cousins. So, that's, you know, it kind of, to me, boils down to, yes, we can, there's a history of why, how we've kind of shut that down. But it actually it plays out in daily life all the time, right? So it's like we're open and receptive, and we have this instinct and drive to explore and understand the world. It's it's very obvious if you watch children; that's what they're doing all the time. And then, well, what happens? Well, this is what why MoveNet talks about. Or one of our fundamental taglines is empowering human nature. Instead of suppressing that instinct, the drive to explore, and move. We're just trying to enable it again mm -hmm. so that the learning process, whether it's through thinking or whether it's through experiencing and following feelings, following where your where your body tells you it wants to be, where your mind tells you it wants to be, like kind of taking a much more holistic approach to honoring what's inside of us, honoring what our body and our minds want to do. And I, I personally think that like, People get afraid of that, right? They're like, well, kids, they just want to run around and go crazy and blah, blah, blah. We have to put them under control, put them in a desk so that otherwise they'll never learn anything. They won't be able to get a job. It's like, I don't really, I, I don't really think that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we can provide the scaffolding of knowledge and we can infuse movement into that. And we can just empower each human being to be what they are. And I think that puts you in that receptive state just by being, just by learning how to be who you are. That's where the self-knowledge is so important. This time to get away from all the forces that tell you that kind of pigeonhole you into this. Well, you got to get a job and do it this way and make an education and make money. All true. But why does it have to be done the way in this linear path that we have set? That doesn't have to be. And I think that's where a lot of forward thinking schools are trying to find that balance between structure and freedom. Right. And. That's what we're trying to do, too, through Move That in Schools. That's something, a program that we're rolling out actively as we speak, where it's like, how can we infuse principles of freedom and instinct into the classroom? How can we help regulate ourselves and actually be more receptive and open to learning and without shutting ourselves down and shutting down our senses so that we can actually learn better, so that we can be better scientists and better thinkers and better artists, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so that state that you say, I think that comes just by being outside is really just, again, like going back to that state, as you mentioned, of being a child, receptive, open to everything, to thought, to what's within, to learning, all that, all of it. It happens. It's our nature. It's our, you know, like we have this, again, a mm -hmm. neocortex, this high level awareness that seems to drive us to, to try to discover like what the world is and who we are. And so all we need to do is enable it and yeah. not shut it down. Yeah. And each person it's going to express through them in different ways. And that's, that's great. That's, that's the diversity and beauty of and richness of, of what human culture could be just people expressing their gifts, their, their personal inclinations, their personal nature, and bringing it forth to the world, you know, instead of, again, like making this hierarchy of who's, who's, uh, who's good, who's bad, who's right, who's wrong, you know, like there definitely is right and wrong, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, so much of what's wrong is because of what we're doing to people, shutting them down. Yeah, everybody's got to sit in a classroom, in the same desk, in the same way. Screw that. It should be everyone being true to their own human nature in their own u unique way. We are all exactly the same at a certain level of abstraction. And within that sameness, there's lots of variation in all kinds of different dimensions. Um, and denying that is denying reality. It's being kind of platonic. It's being what 
Stephen Jay Gould was speaking against, writing against in his article, The Median is a Message. One thing I like about that is that he actually identified how Platonism is the problem there of people trying to take abstractions as being real and not concretes. Um, so very interesting article, but yeah, people like kids need to get out and if they're in a classroom and they got to listen to something else, um, they're kind of learning on their own, but they're not really being taught to trust their own judgment and trust their own experience as much. They should be out in nature as like Montessori, some maybe Waldorf, some nature schools do. Students can learn to identify and experience reality on their own. So what I think there's some unfortunate experience with like cats about something like that, like a cat that can move around a kitten when it's growing up versus a kitten that um, can't do anything. Um, the one that can't do anything and can only like observe, can't move around and investigate the environment does not grow up to be um, capable of dealing with the world. Yeah, well, it makes sense. It's like spatial reasoning is a form of intelligence, right? Like you move around, you you are reasoning in a way, right? And a lot of times, just because things are connected, they obviously are very interconnected in the brain and everywhere. This type of movement facilitates thought too, right? And facilitates understanding. I know, I mean, even as I talk with you, so I'm, I'm, I'm standing around, I pace around and stuff. It just helps. It helps me think. Yeah. It helps me think better. Sometimes moving doing ground movement or just, geez, when I'm out in nature doing, you know, a little quest and off a trail, like these thoughts that flow through are amazing, right? So to try to just, to, again, we're disempowering ourselves by limiting ourselves. It's not like, I, see, I think people see these Montessori schools and such as like very hippie. It's just kind of like, well, they're not getting anything done. Yeah. I don't really, I can't speak to it because I don't know how they do any of, of their methods. But as a whole, it's just logical to say that, like, we can help regulate ourselves for learning and actually learn better by including some movement, right? And certain movements might actually help us learn certain things better or just regulate us better. And that's what we're, that's what really what we're trying to unpack and bring forth through MoveNet and schools is, okay, how do we, how do we do, how do we balance this and infuse these things and this understanding and maybe even explore how certain movements help with certain tasks so that we can um, help kids who would, especially would, who are not inclined to just sit still and think, uh, empower their own nature and, and like, find their way. Like the Thomas the Edison. Yeah. <laughs> or right. people who hated authority like um, Albert Einstein. And yeah, exactly. Right. So like. I mean, some of the most brilliant minds are the ones that rebel against authority. If anything, it's a lot of ways it's in, it's brilliant and intelligent to rebel against what is illogical. Yeah. It's <laughs> you like, know, like I'm an independent thinker. They're recognizing that on some level, even if not philosophically, I'm an independent thinker. I'm an independent human. Respect that or I will not respect you. Yeah, that's you know? very logical. Yeah. yeah. I, I know. It's like that's higher level thought at the end of the day. Submission to authority is not what we want. Right. Um, I think that, you know, like order is necessary, right? We got a, whatever, six, seven billion people in the world. Order is necessary, but it's also logical. When it's logical, it's necessary. Yeah. When it's illogical, it's not. And dangerous. And at yeah. the end of the day, that's why I feel like we're on the brink. I don't know when, but of, of some sort of a renaissance again of I hope. science and art <laughs> I and wish. understanding. I really think we are. Sometimes it takes falling deep into chaos and despair to, to, to kind of bring forth something beautiful. Yeah. And um, that's, I, I know it in my heart, honestly, that that's going to happen because at the end of the day, as science progresses, as we understand more of the world and how interconnected it is, and we empower human nature to, to, to create to problem solve and create beautiful solutions um, so that we can all live in harmony, not just, not without, that harmony doesn't mean not, not without conflict. Conflict will always happen, mm -hmm. but to some sort of understanding, higher level understanding of each other, 
including nature, including animals, including plants, including bacteria and fungi and all that. You see, you see it emerging. I think it's just going to take some higher level synthesis to bring it forth. And it might happen slowly, but it will happen. Otherwise, we'll destroy ourselves. And I really don't think we're that dumb, personally. <laughs> At least not everybody. Some, yes. Some, <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why it takes time, right? They say uh, that's sort of the karmic idea of accumulating wisdom through lifetimes, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What do you do on some of your quests? Like you say, you go on a quest. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So that's kind of like something I've always done on large or small scale since I was pretty young you know for me when I was very young I'd just go out into nature and go fishing or look for I was really obsessed with reptiles and amphibians so I'd go hunting in a sense I wouldn't kill anything but just look for things and then as I got older especially when I was rebelling against the institutions of college and such I took a semester off and I just went essentially across the country in my and slept in the back of my truck and cool. just got out into nature and spent time out there just kind of like thinking and discovering and feeling and discover and discovering for myself what I wanted to get, giving myself the time to truly set my life path and what I want to do, maybe not my whole life path, but what I wanted to do at least in the next year or two. And so that continues to play out. I went on another long quest, you know, after going through a divorce. And now I continue to do many ones. I just actually did one yesterday. You know, I just go down, um, follow a path, go off a path, go fishing, just get lost for a day. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of elements that are happening. I can't really pinpoint. It's not intentional, a lot of the things. I don't even necessarily come up with a plan. It's more so I test myself. I think, I feel, I enjoy, I experience. I, 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 th I tend to think about myself and what I should do. I think about what, what is reality and I just kind of bring back and think about some of the ideas I've already come up with and, and my understandings, think about the science I've learned and then just allow new insights to flow through, through observation and just the magic that happens when you clear your mind and let, you know, let your let your inner wisdom speak. And, um, yeah, that's, so that's what it means to me. A quest at the end of the day, the essence of it is seeking for seeking for something. And for me, it's understandings of how to go about my life in the most precise, um, joyful, um, tolerant and, and, um, you know, open way, you know, like, uh, I'm not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes, <laughs> say dumb things or, you know, like have to work through shadows. And so a lot of it, too, is just giving myself time to accept reality as what it is, including some of the stuff we don't like. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of for me, the quests are just a place to go and and just really put life into perspective, let's say, by seeing the whole, by, by kind of putting myself in front of the whole nature you know, things just kind of fall into place naturally. Mm -hmm. that's and it's people, enjoyable. Yeah, that's something people can do a lot. Doesn't have to be a big thing like we might read about in literature, but could just be, as you say, um, a brief one hour or half day thing. Sounds like it's what you're doing too, man. You're getting out there, just doing what you feel. You know, it's not a prescription per se. It's just what you feel at the end of the day, and it, it, it infuses beauty in your heart. Um, my uh, my fiance Megan, she told me that about this beautiful thing somebody said to her. She was in Greece looking at ruins, and the tour guide said something along the lines of, "When you see beautiful things, you become more beautiful." Hmm. And I believe that I, I do because at the end of the day. What is beauty? But when things fall in order, when things start to make sense, when when feelings flow, when you find homeostasis in your body, nature is beautiful when all these forces come together and create something magical, right? Like, to me, it's the same process. When you put yourself in front of nature's beauty, 
things fall into order inside yourself and you become more beautiful and you do more beautiful things. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. So how much? So, yeah. I, with move that as a whole, that's something that I personally try to subtly steer people toward. I never, you know, everyone has their own path and their own way. Some people for move that like similar to parkour, maybe like the higher level movements and the, the capability and the strong to be helpful thing like that really resonates with them. And, and that does me too. But I, I just think there's a lot more that can be gained from the practice of natural movement. Yeah. It enables you to open up doorways into yourself that ultimately create your own freedom that create your own true self and power your, your, your truest self to come forth and, and help you live the life that you want to live joyfully, happily, and sometimes, you know, not ignoring all the other emotions that are a part of the human experience, sadness and grief and, and turmoil and stuff, but to accept them and integrate in your life into something that is your own masterpiece. Yeah. And people can contemplate, meditate indoors, and that's a place to do it. But outdoors is just so much more rich and fulfilling and varied indoors human built stuff usually flat monotonous not a lot of change um inanimate in the outdoors we're connected with life life is all around us we're flowing with it and in it we're flowing in it it's flowing in us there's variation and change every second as well as through the months and years in decades, nothing is ever the same. It's just visually so much more rich and deep and what I guess people would say like getting all more technical, all fractal. Whereas inside, yes. as I say, kind of flat, it's like, you know, I look around and there's not a lot of richness or variation. Um, I couldn't really contemplate the beauty of what's around me. Like, oh, look, look at that beautiful white wall over there. Whoa, you know, whereas this morning being out in nature, it's alive. It's vital. I'm connected with it. It's like just the different leaves and the pine needles and the leaves on the ground, just so much texture and visual richness um like th this indoors is like almost nothing by comparison um and also nature allows you to confront fear which is a huge thing too if you're inside how are you ever going to truly confront fear you're other than just like the fears that are just sitting in your own mind right mm -hmm. like you go outside and you gotta you know jump from one rock to another you see what you're made of. Maybe you're there's there's maybe there's animals that you do have to be alert and aware of. You know, like it, I think evokes a little bit of a fear response here and there that you can learn to work through. Whereas yeah, so much of the fears right. that exist in our minds are like, geez, it's things that we can't even really truly work through. It's things we can't control. Whereas nature, it's kind of like, okay, I can become capable. I'm strong. I'm able. I sure. can make this jump or maybe I can walk around it or, you know, I can defend myself. I'm okay. You know, like it helps you work through fear in a very concrete way. Whereas working through the fear of, you know, like economic or financial catastrophe, like that, does that ever really go away? You know, like at the end of the day, we're, we're locked in these fears of things we totally can't control. And it just lends itself to rumination and not good things. Whereas we get outside, we get exposed to levels of fear that we can actually master, which I think is very powerful and lends itself to mastering some of those other fears that exist in our lives. Yeah, true. And then it helps you get connected with the fundamentals in a bigger context. Yeah, maybe people have some fear of an economic shutdown, um, economic problems on a broad scale. But you go out in the woods, and you know what? The woods don't give a damn. There ain't no economic shutdown there. There's just 
life and vitality and enjoyment. And there's competition, yeah, but people misrepresent evolution and Darwin too much. There's also a lot of cooperation. That's one thing Darwin actually identified himself to. People find out more. There's a lot of cooperation in the world out there keeping things alive and going. Um, you get out there to the unchanging, the real um, economic shutdown or no, this stuff is there. The Rocky Mountains are the Rocky Mountains and they're beautiful, period. Um, or some big beach somewhere on the Pacific or Atlantic. Um, unchanging, real, not affected by that stuff. It helps totally agree. put things in context. Um, and getting out there and just contemplating and experiencing this vast, unchanging, you know, within our lifetimes, kind of, of course, you know, I know that the earth came about and all that stuff, but, um, for us, basically all this unchanging stuff in our lifetime, no one's going to get rid of the Pacific ocean and nothing's going to change it. Um, and so on. So you get out there and get in touch with the stuff that's stable, timeless, kind of, in our context. Um, you get the idea of more permanence. Contemplate. And just like maybe um, when you observe and appreciate the beautiful, you become the beautiful. Same thing. Get out there and observe and appreciate the timeless, the permanent, and you become more timeless and permanent. You got a better base. Amen. I agree with that 100%. So I, I really, you know, like, I think that our, the people who listen to this podcast, a lot of them, especially the people involved in MoveNet, probably have experienced a lot of this stuff to a degree or maybe have a thirst to get outside. There's something that compels them outside. Yeah. So just like anything else, building a little bit more awareness on why you're doing something can just foster it. Right. So that you do more of it. So I, I hope that this type of these ideas, these thoughts can help empower, um, and just, um, you know, encourage someone who's thinking like, Hey, why do I want to do this? Do I need to make time for this? Or it's like, yeah, you do. This is like incredible this stuff. This is actually the, the marrow and the meat of life. Mm-hmm. Um, just as much as the other things you do and it, it all works synergistically. So yes, I hope that as you mentioned right in the beginning, like, that rather than us just saying like, get outside as a command, it's like, I hope those that listen understand why it's important and thus, you know, create the time for it and the space for it so that they can, so that we can all do our part in in leading our own, our own best lives, which leads to, I think, benevolence and magic and whatever you want to call it, alchemy, goodness, cohesion, synchronicity, synchronicity in the world itself. We all do our part. And then if some people don't want to get out alone, um, they can still do it in a group, small group, two, four, ten, go out, um, have a time where no one can talk for ten minutes or an hour. Everyone just goes out. You know, you got the company of each other. Um, if people need to do that to feel safe for some valid reason, um, do it. Go out, find a place, sit enjoy, contemplate, or stand, or everyone walk, hike, move through the woods together without saying anything, Everyone, so everyone's able to observe and connect with the nature and kind of tune out that social thing that's always kind of on. We are social animals, but being an animal... And being social means being in a broader world. We need to be in connection to that world. Too much of modern society. People get lost in all this social stuff. And um, especially with some of the technology that allows people to 
not have to get connected to the world to get food, um, get berries, get meat, get marrow, um, get water. So there's all this stuff. So they're like, and then they're living, they think they're separate, even if implicitly kind of separate from or above nature. Um, but we're not, we need to like get back in touch with nature if we need to. Um, so go out in a group and no one talk. Um, go crawl, walk through the woods, going slow, paying attention, um, focusing on the world, and then get back to the social aspect. Yep. But totally. Do you got some ideas for contemplation or meditation when people are out like what are some things some suggestions you have that concrete things that people could do or any like guided meditation um that you could tell them that they could write down or listen to out in the woods um or remember and go through when they're out in nature yes so i would say or beach yeah, absolutely. So I would say the most primary thing I would recommend for folks is just to set aside an hour or two, find a place that you know that you like or find a new place, whatever, whatever works. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be like some epic quest or anything. It can just be something nearby, but somewhere that where there's as much nature as possible. And spend a little bit of time walking and moving and exploring without any intention other than exploration itself. See what you find. I think focal points are really nice, right? Like goals, like look, my, my fiance likes to look for rocks or arrowheads. I like to look for animals. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like I to look for everything. Plants, plants yeah. animals. Look, <laughs> see what you can find. Even Tracks. human artists, whatever. Yeah. Dig, whatever. Do, do whatever you want. Do some movement. I think that's a really good way to shift your, um, your mind, to slow your thoughts down and at least give them one pointedness, which is the goal of a lot of meditation is just to kind of kind of like consolidate your thoughts and put them in the present and give them one pointedness and the movement. Also, again, if you're not moving, your mind's going to churn. There's always movement going on in your body. So when your body moves, your mind churns less, you know? Um, and so the movement and the one point in this lends itself to setting the stage for a nice meditation from there or contemplation. So after a little bit of time, half an hour, hour, two hours, whatever you prefer, um, I would recommend finding a spot that's comfortable to sit or lie. A lot of people get hung up on this like erect posture, this meditation posture. If that works for you, great. If it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, just find somewhere you can lean against a tree, whatever feels good. And just um, from there, I would recommend just kind of observing, like looking around you and allow thoughts to come through. So instead of trying to stop thoughts, just allow thoughts to come through. And if they're of the kind of like typical nature, you can just kind of let them flow through you. But you can sort of uh, stoke the fire, per se, by just sort of asking questions too to yourself. Ask inward questions like, some of the things I've already recommended here, like who am I or what is reality or how do I feel? Uh, yeah. How do I feel? What, 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 what do I need to know right now to help me to serve me better in my life? Really simple, concrete questions like that. They could be really big questions or really simple questions. Ask yourself and then just kind of see what yourself answers. Like, and I don't know, for me, I can tell the difference between when my like logical mind is answering, just kind of like, well, this is what I heard. So this is what I should say. This is what I've heard. It's like, okay, that's that part of me. But then there's this part of you that flows that seems to have the answers. And, you know, we can have a philosophical debate on, on what that, where that comes from. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, the answers tend to flow and you start to think in, in higher let's say less primitive patterns or less primal brain fear-based thinking and much more like open, receptive, integrated thought stuff tends to flow. And, um, I think that's the essence of contemplation is to get to that space of what, what I would call and others have called spiritual mind, 
instead of just purely physical or um, primal brain thinking. And that, so that would be a real simple drill. I have a lot of other direct meditation techniques I use to help facilitate relaxation and facilitate contemplation that incorporates looking at the parts and the whole. I actually put you guys through one of them in level three. Yeah. Um, but I do not have any guided versions of that available right now. I'm going to start making some of these though. So if this is something that, um, for the listeners out there, if you'd like to hear some of these things, what I'm still wrestling with is like, should it just be audio? Should it have some visuals, some nature photography type stuff? Or should it be like, what, what sort of format would be best? I'm guessing just something that headphones can be. Um, so probably just audio only, but yeah, I, I'd like to actually build, help people build that practice of, of contemplation and other various practices that connect us to nature and our, our, our inner true nature. Or people can get out and think, what are my stresses? What do I hate so much in life? What's going on? And then think, okay, what are my thoughts? Take a few minutes for the first question or whatever, 10 seconds, five minutes. What are my thoughts? What are my feelings? Yeah. And even more, another layer of that is like, if a particular part of your body ails you to just like ask that part of your body, what's going on? A lot of times, sometimes mm -hmm. that wisdom can flow through your mind. And, you know, again, we, there's a lot of different, I don't know the mechanism of it. I would speak more in spiritual terms. You'd probably speak more in biological or physiological terms, but regardless, just tuning into that part of your body that's ailing you or is, is uncomfortable or, or maybe it's just your mind itself and asking it, a lot of times your body can speak to you through, um, again, your own voice, and that's what contemplation is, or it can speak to you through just feelings or um, even movements, you know, so there's, I think, just like tuning into your own body as a source of wisdom and a source of clearing out whatever's ailing you or just holding you back in general can be another way to contemplate. Oh, and then one could say like, what are my stresses? What are my thoughts? What are my feelings? And then go to like, what am I experiencing? And think about what the world's trying to say. One thing mm -hmm. that, um, to say it more dramatically and rhetorically and to make more of a point, not to be rude, but just to be like more emphatic. Um, people need to go out and shut up and let nature speak to them. So then when they're around people, they can learn better to shut up and listen to other people instead of trying to talk a lot or tell other people what they think. We need to see what the world is telling us, absorb from it, and then learn to be quiet and listen more to other people. Um, there's not enough of that about listening to other people today. There's a lot of people telling you, trying to tell you what you think or get worked up about something without asking you, ask the world, learn to be patient and ask other people. Like some cultures have said, um, through history, we have t two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Like the creator gave us two ears and one mouth so we could listen twice as much as we talk. You know, I totally agree with that. <laughs> I really love the idea of being receptive to nature itself because it's it's uh, it's obvious, but still hard to like listen to other people. But, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the medicine that helps that helps rid us of our stresses and ails lies in nature. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, OK, just being in nature. That's good. But I personally um have experienced a lot of different omens that would be the word that like kind of the new age mystical kind of word that would people would use just various guides that have not come from within that have come from outside of me. And, um, those guides can come in the form of animals. They can come in the form of the wind or the, or the river. They can come in the form of literally things that happen in your life that push you to do things that you didn't necessarily know you or that you know you needed to do, but you just couldn't. And then something pushes you to do it. It can come in the form of something someone says to you. But being receptive to the world ties back into what we talked about earlier, right? Like our senses being deadened. I think our um, a lot of times our inner compass is 
a little bit dead in by not being receptive to the world around us, especially because we're so berated with propaganda and things that are not good for us. Regardless, Mm -hmm. in your contemplations, being receptive to literally what's in front of you um, can be, and let nature speaking to you, I think is a very powerful tool. And I thought, I think I'm glad you uh, brought that up. Cool. Thanks. But Cool, man. Well, to, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. And then in contemplation and being outdoors, we need to, we work on practicing um, what's captured in, I think, like the title of some books or what some people say about some situations. I don't know how far back this goes, millennia, but I know this is like in some, the work of some philosophers, but um, and some of what they say is wrong, but in some biology, um, there's the idea that I contain multitudes. So mm. in some sense, so an ant is just an ant. It has its whole independent nature. It is what it is. But in a way, it contains the universe. It's related to it. There's all kinds of implications about the fact that there are ants. They interact with their environment. The ant flows in the environment. The environment flows through it. Um, So kind of like as doing a PSAT with a student recently, we were doing a reading and there was doing a reading section. Um, Sorry if folks, folks, so here's a place where people might need to get outdoors. If I mentioned the PSAT and all of a sudden everyone feels trauma, <laughs> get outdoors to take care of it. Sorry. Um, welcome to my life. But as I tell students, SAT stands for scholastic aptitude for torture. But in this one reading, great quote, Ed Young said at the end of his paragraph, biology is ecology. I love mm-hmm. that. Um, you got to look at, like it's all about the whole and how things interact. The part and the whole both come together. You can't have one without the other. Um, right. So get out and even learn to observe an ant and see everything wrapped up in it. Or even a rock. Yeah. Even things that aren't alive, right? Like just everything is in everything. Yeah. I love that. But um, any Beautiful. any other recommendations for folks for meditation or contemplation or mindfulness outdoors? Any practices or things they could do? Um, yeah, since you ask, um, you know, another big part of my, I wouldn't say contemplation. This kind of bridges into another practice is um, that, that that's my personal I haven't really had any mentors on this, though I've I've read suggestions of it and experimented with it, is just the practice of trance. And Mm -hmm. that probably sounds like, whoa, is he over there like dancing or doing some weird thing? No, that's not what it is. Um, For me, being outside, when I look at nature, when I look at a rock um, or anything, it tends to happen best when I look at like some sort of a, a vista or a view, but it can happen anywhere. I personally learn how to relax my gaze. Sometimes I look at my peripheral vision. Sometimes I almost, you ever do those old magic eye things, Michael? Mm -hmm. You know what magic eye is? It's like stereoscopic stereoscopic vision where like you look at a page and it turns into 3D if you look at a certain way. Oh yeah, I think I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar to these type of principles, like I relax my gaze, defocalize, and just keep my eyes open for as long as possible and some interesting things happen you know there's uh, i can't precisely say exactly what's happening um but what happens is nature sort of it it, um it morphs in a lot of ways and you could say okay that's my mind maybe it's my mind but to me mind and nature are all one anyway um but I I just see really beautiful things. And sometimes they have some sort of interpret something I can interpret. Oftentimes it's just seeing how, uh, to me, what it is, is seeing the energy that underpins the matter, you know, and maybe even seeing things that wouldn't be um, perceptible under normal vision. 
And so that work to me um, is something I'm still exploring and um, it puts me in a very meditative state and it, I can still contemplate in that space. And it's just a really cool way to experience nature because like colors shift, things change. Like I see certain patterns of light move through and my, my vision shifts between different um, uh, focal points. And um, it's still something, again, I'm kind of exploring and learning, like I said, but that's one practice that I, I, I can't say I necessarily have a concrete reason why someone should do yet. Um, but it's really interesting and really fun and can add another dimension to being out in nature. Um, I see it as allowing nature to reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And what if someone gets out and they're kind of engaging in open eye meditation or they're contemplating, they might just fall into the trance anyway, without knowing it. Um, mm -hmm. it might just happen and they don't identify it as something different than the contemplation or needing a different concept, but they've still done it. It's still going on. Yeah. What I find is just like dreams. Like I see symbols and just like deep meditation, like closed eye, you know, what, what some would call third eye meditation. I see symbols. I don't know how to interpret those symbols. Maybe I need to like l learn that kind of stuff, but there's a, there's a train of thought that says that nature can communicate or your mind can communicate. Again, I, I see those things as those as two, two parts of one whole. Um, in symbols, not in, not always in language, definitely, you know, so that's like the more primordial language of the universe is symbols. And so, um, again, still learning, don't have answers, probably need to see, but it, I, I'm just open and receptive to the idea that nature has things to tell me, and it maybe communicates more through symbols than always through language. Seek, go on the journey. The journey never ends. Exactly. More to find out. But Always more to just, and so yeah, maybe uh, once I've developed that a little more, I will share more about what I find in a future podcast. For now, though, the, the, I think the contemplation is the most act, actionable, awesome thing to do in nature. And um, yeah, I would love to build some more resources to help folks kind of give them the scaffolding to empower their own practice at some you point. Know, this it just occurred to me, I totally different context and meaning of a phrase people say a lot especially maybe in martial arts we're talking about the world observing it learning well it's like you know you got to be contemplative and in a ready state mental ready state well it's like when the student is ready the teacher will appear yes that's right so unless you get out there and you open yourself up to the world the teacher ain't going to be there you got to be ready you're absolutely right. And to be, yeah, you have to, to for your teacher to appear, you got to be ready to listen. No teacher wants to teach someone who isn't going to listen to them. Mm -hmm. A receptive, good learner, you know? Yeah. Beautiful. Interesting. But do you have any new events coming up? Um, anything planned? Anything in the works? Yes. So I mentioned the Move That in Schools program. Um, that's something that's in the works. Can you, but let's see. I don't know if you've talked about that much here. If you got yeah, the time, I we can talk about but, that. Yep. Yeah, so th that program is going to be is, is led by my fi my fiance Megan. Sweet. And it's it's also the, the curriculum director of that program. Basically, my role in this program, um, the equivalent of my role in this program, is Dr. John Morey, who's done a lot of research on physical education, even has some pilot studies in the works. I'll have to talk and, to them. I need to like get in touch. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So they can, they'll be able to explain it better. Um, but the idea is that we're going to have various levels to get educators involved in MoveNet to be able to infuse those principles, both into PE and into classroom integration. And so, yeah, more, cool. more detail about that to come. And then we have, um, of course, a whole new calendar of events coming out for the level one and level two and level three certification. And then we have a few lifestyle events that we're going to be put, putting on the calendar. One with Vic Verdier about uh, that's going to be for men only. It's going to cover topics in the masculine and um, be an event where we push each ourselves a little bit more and um, 
you know, Vic, Vic, the man in black has a, you know, a ex special forces guy. He's got a lot to, a lot of wisdom for, for those that are looking to step into that energy. And then, um, we have another one with Tom Brown, the third, who is the son of the famous tracker, Tom Brown, Jr. And then and that one, Tom Brown Nathan. himself, <laughs> the original Tom Brown also. Yeah. Right. And then, um, so that one's going to be more on nature observation, cool. some, some primitive skills, but more along the lines of meditation, contemplation, some of the things we're talking about here. And, um, and then another one with um, Rory Kaya, who's a level three certified movement trainer who runs um, uh, and is an active part in um, primitive skills and survival based hmm. education. And uh, for those of you that don't know Rory, he's like a real caveman, like full on, like the dude he used to sleep outside most of the year. He lives in Colorado, huh, knows cool. all the kind of key primitive skills to allow you to survive and be comfortable and live abundantly in nature. So we're going to do a survival skills class with him, or we'll actually like make our own debris huts and spend time oh, cool. in nature. And that's right. going to be really cool too. How do you spell his last name? K I A H. Okay. I had it all right, except for the H sweet. So that those events will be announced, um, around November 15th. Okay. okay. I'll be available. I know. Yep. So I'm that's gonna, what we got on. And, you know, personally, I don't have any other. I, I'll be teaching the level three in the U.S. We're going to be doing it in Colorado this year. Hmm, wow, cool. And um, I'll be at the, some of these special events. And I'll just be working on, you know, always improving MoveNet's curriculum and building out our online infrastructure. And, of course, just continuing my own practice. And so it won't actually be this year, right? Colorado will be 2022. Yeah, we're going to do it yeah. in the beginning of September. It'll be right outside of Denver and Con Conifer. And hmm. uh, Nick Smith, who you know, he's a, le he's a level three and now a, a team instructor in training. He has a ranch uh, that's named after his late father. It's called hmm. Final Frontier Ranch. It's a oh, beautiful, cool. beautiful piece of property. How many acres? Uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's close to 200 acres. They, hmm. they own all the way to the top of a mountain. Wow. It's nice. And, uh, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna rough it out there and do a bunch of level three stuff. Sweet. Awesome. And of course we have the same options in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, you'll announce on the MoveNet site, these upcoming things and have more description about what's going to go on. Yes, cool. exactly. All right. Look forward to that. Nice. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Well, yeah. So thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for the discussion and the ideas and your whole life experience and wisdom. Um, good stuff. Thank you. So I'm sure we will meet again and uh, yeah. Enjoy your, enjoy your quests in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> Big quest, little quests, right? All right. Well, thanks. Um, All right. So you have a good day. Enjoy. And uh, talk to you soon. All right. Take, take care, Michael. Thanks.